Hey everybody, welcome to your second video on React Query inside of our React series. This episode, we're going to learn about some of the options for React Query, as well as how to install the dev tools. The dev tools will give us a closer insight to the data that React Query is managing, as well as the cache and everything around it. So definitely recommend it if you're going to be using React Query a lot. So you have the option to change settings inside of your query client that we defined inside of index.js. You also have the ability to provide options inside of the use query. So if you want these settings to be used just for a specific query, then you can define them here. If you want them used everywhere, you can define them here. So I'll show you that in just a moment but I want to first install the dev tools because as we change some of these settings, we can see those inside of the dev tools very easily. So this is actually going to be another package we can install. So we'll say npm install at tan stack slash react query dev tools and let that install. And then we just have to add a single line to our code right here. So not only will we render the app, but actually I forgot, not just a single line, I lied. We have to import one thing. So we'll say import react query dev tools. And for this from here, I think that chose the wrong one. So that might work, I'm not sure, but we are just going to use tan stack slash react query dev tools and let's go ahead and add that second line again sorry about lying to you guys we have to have add two lines in here so react query dev tools and we'll make that self-closing let's go check it out this is what our site looks like now and we have this button down here which we can click and it brings up a console looking thing with our query by name so we named our query test which is defined right here so if you're trying to figure out which query to refer to, you're just going to go by name here and it'll give all the information about it, including the returned data. So you can see why we nested data inside of data in our code is because that's how it's actually structured in the return here. So this will help you traverse to grab whatever data you want. And that's our exact structure we followed right here. There are all kinds of different options you can use for these dev tools. I think initial is open, being set to true actually is quite nice if you're going to be using these a lot. So to do that, you just go into where you defined the React Query Dev Tools component and say initial is open, and we will set that to true. True, true, true. And now when we go to our site, we do a refresh, you can see it pops up automatically and we have the option of closing it. We are also going to open the dev tools over here because I can easily click on and off of our page by clicking here and clicking here. Whereas I can't do that with this panel down here as it's considered part of the same page. So if you want to test some of the auto fetching capabilities of React Query, then I find it easiest to have either another window open you can click or just opening the dev tools here. And you can see as you're clicking this, it, the fetching switches to one briefly and then goes back to stale. If you're not wild about that auto fetching capability, you can go into this new query client and we can pass an object in here. It's gonna be kind of nested mess here, but we'll try to keep it simple. So we will go with default options, which will be an object and then queries, which will also be an object. And then inside of here, you can define all of these different default values. So we're going to have three objects here. The outer object, which has a property default options, which is an object which has queries, which is an object containing all of the different default values. So hopefully that makes good sense. And then what we will do is go through here and find the ones that we are interested in. Now, keep in mind, React Query can get pretty advanced, so it might take some time to pick up on all of these. I think the one I want is refetch on window focus, and we will set this to false. And now when we click on the window and click off of the window, it's not doing that fetch. And whether or not you want that, that's really dependent on what kind of application you're building. What might be more appropriate is instead of doing it every time we visit the page, actually have this data refresh on some kind of timer. So to do that, what we can do is we can set a different option to refresh the data. 
So let's go back and we will add an option here. And what we are looking for is refetch interval. And this is going to take a time in milliseconds. So we could say something like 5,000. Or sometimes when I'm working with milliseconds, I will just do a thousand times some number. And that to me is kind of like a personal convention because I can easily see, oh, I put a thousand here. I must be working in milliseconds. So now when we go back to our site, we can see that it will add a new request every five seconds. And there's another one and another one. And you can see that this value actually hasn't changed in those five seconds. This really depends on the CoinGecko API, how often they refresh that data. Right now we're just making new requests, but we're getting the same data. So if they update that price, say every minute, then we might be making unnecessary requests. Plus they might be using caching as well. Sometimes when you make a request, you will see that this comes from a browser cache, which doesn't appear to be the case in this request. Here's one that has from disk cache. But in theory, if I leave this running long enough, we should get an updated value without having a page refresh, which is quite nice. I will leave this running for a moment and maybe I can catch that moment in action. Oh, there we go. It updated. I didn't have to do anything or click anything. So this is how we can be sure our pages always have the most up-to-date data. Now you might want that auto refresh behavior for something like this, but if you're doing multiple requests on your site, having this refresh interval defined for every query could be a little obnoxious. So an alternative would be to take these settings or maybe just this refresh interval setting and actually move it over to that specific query. So you can define that inside of use query. So to do that, go to the end of your function and pass in another argument. And it's going to be very similar where we can define an object here. And inside of the object, we can just jump right to the property that we want, refetch interval being set to five seconds. So now we can go back to our site. We should have that same automatic refetching behavior. But if we happen to have another query, it should not have that behavior. A little hard to see now, but I actually wanted to show another thing. So what we're going to do is actually create a new query for an API that we own and can control. To do this, what we can do is actually just define another use query and give it a new URL. So let's go down here and we will say const. And this is going to be interesting because now we have multiple instances of data error and is loading. Let's say this was going to be a query for customer data. You could rename these as customer data, customer error, and customer is loading down here. And I'll show you how to do that. Let's say we have data. This is going to be renamed to customer data. And then we have, oh, I was checking this. I think this is just complaining because we haven't actually put the assignment here yet. So after data, we could have error, and that's going to be renamed customer error. And then lastly, is loading could be renamed customer is loading. And that's how we could organize which data we are referring to. However, although this works, if you're going to be doing many queries, this can get a little obnoxious. You don't want to have all these bloated variables floating around everywhere. So an alternative, instead of destructuring, you could just contain everything in a single object. And let's say we call this one price and I'll, I'll say price query. And then down here, what we can do is we could say this one is customer query. And these objects are going to contain all of the properties we might need. So we don't have to do all of the funky renaming. However, it's going to alter our code down here. So what we'll do is say price query dot error and then price query dot is loading and then lastly price query dot data and you may need to do the optional chaining here checking if these have values so we will add an optional chaining there there and there that'll just avoid any runtime issues and our site should still work the same Let's just go ahead and fix this real quick on line 24. Again, we have to change what's actually being printed here. So price query dot data dot data dot Bitcoin dot USD. All right, our site is pretty close. I think we're just having an error now because we still have this customer query here that hasn't been fully defined. So now our site works exactly as it once did. However, we are now using this 
object to contain all of the properties. Now we can easily define another use query down here. And this is where we will give it another name. So this one we could change to say price. And this one is going to be defined very similarly. We will call this one customers. So now when we look at our dev tools, we should see two different queries. Similarly, we will define a function and inside of here we will just say return Axios passing in our URL. Now if you're jumping into the series for the React query content, you may not already have our API built that we've used in previous episodes. That's okay, you can just watch this section if you want or you can download the source code. So in GitHub, we have defined two APIs. We created one inside of Next and we have also created one inside of Django. So I'm gonna go with the Next.js API and I will get that running in a new window. So I'm going to open that here and then I will open a new terminal window. It would be a pretty similar experience if you clone the repo. And I'll say npm run dev. And this took over localhost 3000. So now when we visit our browser, we're getting the other application. So let's just go ahead and stop our React application because I know it will actually ask if we want to switch to a different port which we can say yes, and that will open it up in a new local host. In this case, it was 3002. Yours may be 3001, it doesn't really matter, but now we can see both of our queries here. So now that we have this query for customers, we just have to define that exact URL. So it's going to be localhost 3000 API slash customers. And you can see here's our customer data. So I will copy this API endpoint and bring that over into our query and paste that here in a string. So now we can save and take a look at our front end. We'll go into customers. Data is currently null, so I'm going to take a look at that network request. Cores error. This is because our server is running on localhost 3000 and our front end is running on localhost 3002, which are considered different origins, or you can think of them as different domains. So, what we need to do is we need to tell our back end that, hey, requests coming from localhost 3002 are okay. So, to do this, we are going to use a library, Next.js cores, which we are going to install. And then all we need to do is say which origins are allowed here inside of our API endpoint. So go ahead and install Next.js cores, and then we will import this. So we'll say import, and I believe this is called Next cores from Next.js cores. And then down inside of our function right here, we can call await Next cores. This will take the request as well as the response, followed by an object with the cores options. So we will say what methods are allowed. And in here we will say get and we will say post. And I believe that is all that's being used in this example. And then for the origin, you can say origin asterisk, which will allow everything. Or you can be more specific on exactly what you want, which we might take a look at in a second. So we will now say option success status and this will be 200. The docs mentioned that this is for legacy browsers, so maybe it'll work without it, but we'll put that there and we'll save. Doing a quick refresh on our site, you can now see that customers has some data and that request right here worked. However, you may not want to allow all origins to access this API. So instead of an asterisk here, we could define this as an array and we will say HTTP colon slash slash localhost 3002. This should still work. And I will clear the cache and hard reload and see that we still have data down here and we were able to get the customers. So no problem. However, if this didn't have 3002, let's say it was 3001. And this is why you would want to refresh that cache because you can see it looks like it's still working, but if I actually empty cache and hard reload, it actually gives us a cores error. So we want to make sure we have 3002 in this list since that's the endpoint that I'm using in this video. However, many of you are probably using 3001 or something similar. So we could probably add these in a list like so. And now that we went down that rabbit hole and everything is working, we can see that we have two queries here 
However, the one that refreshes every five seconds is only for the price. So the settings that were defined here for the query client, these are being used for both of them. So it's not refetching on window focus for either of them. And then it's only refetching every five seconds for the price query. You could, of course, add a different setting for this one down here. And there's tons of different settings on here. But let's go ahead and add refetch interval for this one. And I'm going to say every 10 seconds here. So now we should get two requests for the price for every one request of the customers. So there's a first price. And then the next two are going to happen probably pretty close to each other. Yep, you can see them happening both. And now we should just get an individual price. Yep. And then we should get both of them. Perfect. So you can see that it is working. And now that we have a use query for an API we control, it'll be a bit easier to talk about what I want to talk about next, which has to do with queries going stale and caching data. So stay tuned. I'll see you in the next episode. Peace out.